Okay, so um, for columns, we're gonna have a few slides. This is gonna be the first one, when we force concrete columns. And columns, we're gonna be handling here gravity columns, which means columns supporting a dead load and life load. They do not support seismic forces or wind forces. Seismic forces means forces due to earthquake. This gave be completely different animal. So for here, for this course, we are covering only gravity columns. It is true that these columns, they are not designed to support seismic forces, like earthquake forces, but they're gonna be riding with the building, which means when the building moves, they're gonna move with it. So typically they are gonna exposed to lateral displacement and they need to be designed for them. Here are some column types. We call this tight column or rectangular column, if you like. Why tight columns? Because we look here at the ties, the way the ties are hooked to the vertical rebars. So this is like a cross section looking down like plan view. This is also plan view. So this gives you one type. Here is the second type. And this is the third type, like type C. So you have here the concrete section. And it could be maybe 18 by 18 inch, 24 by 24. It could be any size. It could be maybe 12 by 18. It could be rectangular in section. At each corner, you need to see here one vertical rebar. So this is like the blue ones are the vertical rebars. Same thing when you have here a spiral column, like round column. You're going to see here the vertical rebars. They are also shown in blue. And then you're going to see a spiral or a kind of a tie around it. The big difference between tight columns and spiral columns is going to be in the way that you put the ties. So when it comes to vertical rebars, we may have the same rebar. I mean, a vertical rebar is going to be a vertical rebar, like what you see here in the elevation. The main difference is going to be the way that we put the ties. Each tie here, it is a space, a certain spacing, and this is spacing typically in California, it goes between four to six inches. Most likely it's going to be six inches. And there's a way to design it. So the spacing here between ties for gravity columns is going to be six inches. You see here when it comes to spiral, the spiral or the tie itself, it is like one piece. It starts from the top and goes all the way to the bottom. That's why you see here this dashed line in the back. Here, each tie is going to be separate from the top tie. It's completely one separate piece. As you see here, you see the way that they cut it. So you have a couple of hooks. And this is going to be a separate piece from this, separate piece from this. But in here, it's going to be just one piece. You know, like the spring. It looks like a spring, you know. But it's not really a spring. Just one piece of rebar that goes around the vertical rebar. When you put any ties or any spiral, they need to be out of the rebar which means the vertical rebars can be contained within this tire. The big question is why do you need vertical rebars and why do you need ties? Let me remind you. In beams, we need the longitudinal rebars. We need it to resist the tension, like to add more capacity to the section. And the ties, is going to be to bring all the bars together, longitudinal bars together, and also to provide shear resistance. If you remember here that for the shear resistance, we have a component coming from the concrete strength, and the other component is coming from the tie strength. Now the question is, how about columns? You can say columns, vertical rebars to resist axial load with the concrete. So concrete is going to have a certain amount of resistance in compression. These vertical rebars, they are also provide a resistance or a strength for axial load capacity, which means for vertical loads. The question is, how about the ties? You can see these ties, the job is number one, to bring all of these vertical rebars together, to put them all together. Just imagine once you start here to apply 
vertical load or axial load on the column, what's going to happen? This force here is resisted by both the steel and the concrete. When you start to increase this load, this column here wants to open up laterally, meaning this tie or vertical rebar it wants to do this. It wants to open up in both sides. And what's going to bring them together is giving you these ties. This is why we're going to have here um, a design for the tie spacing. So the problem is if you put, let's say, the tie spacing at 24 inch on center or 18 inch on center, this vertical bar is going to be bucking between a tie to a tie. Let me explain this a little bit more. So let's say here's a tie which works as a support to the vertical rebar. And once you start here to apply high axial load, the bar is going to start to buckle this way. And so forth in both lines. So the rebar wants to open up because the vertical pressure is transferred into transverse pressure. What's going to be holding it back in place is going to be all of the styles that we provide. When you look here at the spacing, we call this the spacing. We usually use the term S. So S is going to be the tie spacing. When you go here to the spiral column, it's true that this is not to scale. But you see here that the pitch, which means the spacing for the spiral, is going to be smaller than that for the tight columns. As a typical for this pitch, usually it's going to be three inches. So we're working here with three inches only. But here we're talking about four inch to six inches. So, okay, four to six is not bad. I mean, this means that this column is going to be really tough to build. When the spacing here comes very close, the axial load capacity is going to be getting increased. Why? Because you provide confinement to the concrete. So what does it mean by confinement? You guys, you have seen yourself testing of concrete cylinders. Am I correct in this assumption? That you guys you have seen cylinder testing in the structures lab? No, yes. Okay. So what happened once you put here a cylinder under testing and you start to put pressure on it, it's gonna start to open up and it's gonna fail. Now, the strength of the concrete itself is going to get increased once you provide lots of ties around it. So just imagine that you have the same cylinder and then you start to put vertical pressure on it and there is no vertical rebars. This ties here is going to help to keep the concrete as in one piece. Why? Because the concrete properties itself is going to get enhanced once you add the ties in compression. So you're going to be able to attain higher strength and higher streams. There is a third type of columns, which is composite columns. Composite columns means that you're going to be using structural steel sections, like a pipe. You see this pipe? Or maybe a W section. And then you put the concrete inside the pipe, or you encase the W section with concrete. So instead of adding vertical reinforcing, like number three or number seven or number eight, you are going to be adding here steel sections, like structured steel section. Just imagine here that you put the concrete inside this pipe. This pipe here is providing lots of confinement to the concrete. Now we start to put pressure on this concrete section. This concrete is going to be very hard to fail. Because for it to fail, it needs to open up so that you're going to see here vertical cracks.
since some of you guys you have not seen testing of cylinders in the structures lab let me show you what's going to happen so what we do here it is here that we bring a mold and this mold is made of metal sometimes it's just plastic like pvc regular pvc and then we fill in the cylinder with concrete like what you see here in this picture we fill it in with concrete we top it and then we let it harden and then we strip this cylinder you can just cut the plastic cylinder from outside now you have the cylinder here and then you put it in testing here's what happened in testing you put vertical pressure right and then you start to test it so let me look for a good picture here for testing here's a testing machine or maybe here's another testing machine so what you do here you put this concrete cylinder inside the machine and then you start to put pressure till it fails and for that you're going to be doing the stress strain relationship if you can if you have a means to measure the strains if you don't have means to measure the strains you're going to be just taking the maximum value that the concrete is going to be attaining to and this value we call the f prime c this is exactly what you have here here's the test machine you put the concrete cylinder in the middle and then you start to put pressure on it till it fails. You see where it fails? What happens? It just opens up. Otherwise, failure would never happen. So the concrete here needs to fail in tension, which is going to be perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of it. Let me show you more picture here. So on it. Look, it's going to crack this way because it wants to open up. Now, imagine that you provide here confinement. See here, like, for example, like the steel pipe. I'm going to be talking about the steel pipe. You start to put vertical pressure on it. He wants to open up. And this is steel is resisting, which means the steel here is providing confinement. And confinement pressure means it's going to be lateral pressure acting on the cylinder from outside. This pressure here is going to be enhancing the concrete strength. So let's say that the concrete strength without this confinement is going to be failing at 4,000 psi. Once you provide this confinement, it's going to be failing maybe at 4,500 or maybe 5,000 psi. And also the attainable strain, the 0.03 that we are talking about, is going to be much higher, maybe five or six times than the 0.03. So this confinement is going to be very important. So I'm going to be comparing here the strength of this column versus the strength of this column. You can see this is going to be much stronger because you have lots of confinement. And here, you don't really have any confinement in a case like this. Now, how would you compare spiral columns to tight columns? Which one do you think is going to be stronger if we match the same cross-section area of the concrete and the same vertical rebars? You say in a spiral column here, you have more confinement. So I'm expecting that the strength for the spiral columns is going to be higher than that for type columns. Why? Because of confinement. So you have a reason for the spiral sections or spiral columns to be stronger than that of the type columns. Here is some picture for tight columns. As you see here, like rectangular section, and then you have lots of dowels sticking above the column, and then you have the tiles. When you pour the concrete, you don't pour the entire concrete for the columns and the slab at the same time. So first you build the columns, and then after that you take out or you strip the forms for the form work. And then after that, you put form work for the slab. The slab is going to be coming above that. If you look here at this picture, you have all the vertical rebars, and then you have the ties. And you see, you have lots of ties here. You see the space in between ties? This is going to be lots of ties. This is what you call here type columns. Look for the spiral columns. Look what happened. This is going to be like a spiral. This is going to be one piece of rebar. And you can maybe weld the spiral itself. And in many cases, you can just splice it. The splice it means that you put it like next to each other. 
because you imagine for this round pi around the spiral, what length we're going to be talking about of this spiral. Now, as you see here in the picture and in this picture, that use the pi size or bar diameter is going to be smaller than the vertical rebars. So now I'm going to go back here to my two sections. I'm going to say what rebar size is maybe kind of standard that you use in vertical rebars and what type of pi bar size that you would use here. So I'm going to say for the pi is most likely I'm going to be going with number three and number four. Is going to be for the ties. How about the vertical rebars? Well, I'm going to say standard. I'm going to say maybe number six, all the way to number 11. So you're going to go to number five. So you're going to be starting maybe at number six, number seven, eight, all the way to number eight. You can use number nine, 10, 11, any of this size. When you put here some vertical rebars, maybe you'd like to use the same rebar size in the same column. So you're not going to put here number seven and this give you number eight or two here, number eight, two, number seven, no. You'd like to have symmetry around this axis here. And if this gave you a square column, for the square columns, you'd like to seek symmetry around X and Y axis as much as possible. Let's look here for the load versus the string. I'm talking here about a column. So here's our column exposed to vertical load. And this gives you the vertical strain measured because you know once you apply this force here on the column, the column is going to get a little bit shorter. So I'm going to do here this diagram between the load to the strain. You apply some load, you get some strain, and at the beginning, you're going to have this elastic relationship at the beginning in early stage. This give you like a line, linear relationship. After that, because you know the concrete is not really elastic, you're going to see that the curve here is going to be going down a little bit. So it's not going to be a straight line. At certain point, the column is going to start to yield. So I'm going to call this as to be the yield point. We understand that this is not going to be here ductile failure. So if failure to happen, this is not going to be ductile. It's going to be brittle failure. And don't forget that the fee factor here is going to be very low. So if you have a tight column, the fee factor is going to be compression controlled. And I'm expecting the fee factor to be 0.65. It's going to be compression controlled here. It's not going to be tension controlled. There is no moment applied on the column yet. And very soon, you see what happens to the column? When you have a tight column, it's going to start to fail. When you have a spiral column, you're going to have more confinement. And look what the confinement is going to do. So for a spiral column, this is going to be just continuum. Why? Because the spiral column here with the confinement is going to be provide more enhanced properties as a concrete. This includes higher trends. Look what the trends here. What's going to happen? Here's a transfer type column. And if you have a column, maybe with the same reinforcing and same concrete cross section and same material properties, look what happened. Spiral column strength is going to be higher. And look at the amount of strain now. It's going to be much higher than that for type columns. Compare this here, this limit or this level of strain compared to this limit of strain. So someone's going to say, why don't we just build the spiral columns since the spiral columns are that strong? I'm going to say, in many cases, you don't really need the spiral column. You don't really look for a round column. Besides, there's additional cost for doing this. And look at the formwork. This is going to be a different formwork. Now let's look here for this spiral column. What vertical rebar size uh, would you use? Professor, one question. 
Yes. So uh, the reason why we would use a spiral column is for the strength, assuming we had a budget, uh, but as opposed to a rectangular column, correct? This is one of the reasons. The other reason also is give you the architectural look. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Because, yeah, because in many cases, if you have just a regular building, it's give you, let's say, an office building, you don't want to see lots of round columns. Round columns could be a good feature, let's say, if you have a parking structure and you decide to have it, or maybe a covered, like, exhibition or big hole that you'd like to cover it, and you'd like to see this round nice columns, then it's going to be okay. But in lots of cases, uh, the architect is going to decide and say, I'd like to stay here with rectangular columns. Now, talking about spiral columns, I'd like also to think and give you some typical values for the rebar size. So I'm going to say the vertical rebars is going to be exactly the same. So I can say here is going to be number six to number 11, which is good. For the tie, most likely is going to be number three and number four, right? But most likely is going to be number three. Unless you go to big columns, like for bridges. And in bridges, this number for the ties can be much larger. You can go to number five and number six if you need to, because the column size is going to be completely different. In a building, I'm expecting that the spiral column maximum size maybe three feet max. But once you go to a bridge, it could be maybe six feet. It could be five feet easily. So here we are talking about two different scale of construction. So in buildings also. I'm going to say here the size of the column, maybe it's going to be 24 inch or maybe 30 inch. And it's going to be it. But for bridges, I'm expecting this maybe to be four feet by four feet. So it's going to be 48 by 48 or maybe 60 inch by six, five feet by five feet. So in a case like this, forget about the tie size that I'm talking here about and forget about the use of number six. Most likely are going to be working maybe only with number 11 in bridges. Otherwise, you're going to have too many rebars. It's going to be just too much work and labor just to build one column. So we're good here with the performance of a spiral column versus tight columns. We understand the reason. And what is the reason here? I'm going to say the reason, the difference is going to be the confinement. This is going to be the secret. I'm expecting a question like this. It's going to come maybe in your midterm, in your final. What is the reason that spiral columns are stronger than tight columns? Here is a previous slide that we have seen before for the fee factor for beams and sections exposed to axial load and moment. So the same diagram here, I can use it for columns. In columns, I'm not going to have any tensile strain, most likely, as long as I have only active compression force. In a case like this, I'm going to say my fee factor for tight columns is going to be the 0.65. And for a spiral columns, it's going to be the 0.75. So actually this line, which means right here, these two values get before column design. So mainly for columns, you are gonna be here and for beams, you're gonna be here. If you have the proper design, because someone's gonna say, how about if I have a beam and I put lots of reinforcing bars in there, the fee factor is gonna drop down. I understand that, yes. Till you get to a point, it's gonna be all compression control, like in columns. A column is gonna be exposed mainly to axial compression. Now, the question is, why do you think the spiral column will have a fee factor of 0.75 and the tight column is going to have a fee factor of 0.65? I said, OK, now I understand. This is giving the effect of the confinement. So this fee factor also, I mean, it is recognized that you're going to have higher fee factor for the spiral columns than other, which means tight columns because of the confinement effect. Now, I guess we're trying here to link the points together, right? So the code recognizes this issue, and they're giving you here higher fee factor when you are using the spiral columns. So, okay, good. All right, good to know. So now I guess 
the use of this diagram is going to be only to read these two values for a spiral column and side columns. So, okay, good. How about tight columns? This is what, what we're going to be starting with first for today. You can see the trends for tight columns is going to be given by this equation. It's going to be only one simple equation. The phi factor, as we say, is going to be 0.65. Phi PN means axial compression strength of the column. It says here axial compression strength. I said, okay. Usually P is used for axial force and T is used for axial tension. So P usually axial compression, most likely. Sub N, which means nominal, and then you multiply by the phi factor. It says here, your phi PN is gonna be equals to 0.8. Now, this 0.8 is not the phi factor because it shows here 0.8 as a constant, but lie by phi. And then it shows here two components. If you look here at this, here is one component for the concrete strength, and here's one component for the vertical steel strength. Okay, let me figure this out. I remember from the beam design, I have a strength for the concrete of 0.85 F prime C times the cross section area of the concrete exposed to compression. I said, yeah, is this the same? I'm going to say, absolutely. Let's look here at the equation 0.85 F prime C. Yes, multiply by the cross section area exposed to compression of the concrete, not the steam. So look what happened here. Cross section area of the concrete, it means for the entire column. Subtracting the vertical steel ratio. So I'm going to say, what is this AST? I'm going to say vertical steel, vertical steel. As in square inches. Which means that you look at all the vertical rebars, you figure out the cross section area of them, and then you use it as AST. Okay, yeah, makes sense. So what is this? Why AG minus AST? It means that you find the concrete area only. Because when you look here at the concrete area, if I may go back here to this one, if this is gonna be 12 by 12, 12 inch by 12 inch, it means 144 square inches of growth section area of the concrete. And then you subtract, let's say that you have four number nine, you take out four. So it's gonna be only 140 square inches because the net area of the concrete is gonna be 144 subtracting the cross section area of the rebars. So now it makes sense. So this component is gonna be for the concrete strength. This component here for the steel strength. I'm gonna say this gonna be here for the steel. F sub Y, the 6K psi, but lie by the cross section area for the steel. I said, okay, yeah. I understand that. So I have here the concrete strength and the C strength. So understand this, concrete strength and C strength. You just add them together, very similar to the shear equation. So it's gonna be that simple. And here we assume or consider that the steel is gonna be yielding and the screw is gonna be yielding. There is no check on that. So the equation is so simple. You just add the C strength to the concrete strength. I'm going to see here, I understand here's the concrete, here's the steel, add them together, multiply by phi, right? The 0.65. Why do we have this 0.8? Why do you reduce it a little bit? Why do you lose 20% of the strength? I'm going to see the reason of this, because you may have some moment on the column with the axial loop. So I was going to say, where's the moment come from? I'm going to say, if I may go back here, taking one of these columns. And let's say that this column is gonna be right in the middle of a building. Meaning I'm gonna have a beam right here. Let's say that you have a beam coming this way. 
and a beam coming this way. It means that you have two reactions. One is coming from this side, and one is coming from this side. Am I correct? Yeah. So what do you have here? You say you have here dead load plus life load. How about on the other side? I'm gonna have dead load. How about if this side is loaded and this side is not loaded? What's gonna happen? You're gonna have only dead load on this side. And it may happen in any column, right? That you're gonna have loading coming from only one side. So what's gonna happen? This beam is gonna be deformed this way. It's gonna be coming like this. Of course, I'm exaggerating here, right? But the amount of rotation is gonna be very limited. It's gonna be very small. It means that you're gonna have some moment coming with the total axial load that goes to the column. So I'm gonna see here, how about if I have a column, let's say an edge column, let's say that this gonna be the end of the building and I have one beam just running this way. It means that you're gonna have here a vertical load is gonna be also dead load plus life load. I can just put it here. So this load here, once the beam is gonna to start to deflect down a little bit, is gonna be taking the column and bend it with it. So for any column, it's true that we say it's gonna be exposed only to axial load, but there should be some moment that goes with it to the column because the eccentricity of the load. What does it mean by eccentricity? Eccentricity means that the point load is not gonna be right in the middle of the column. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay, good. So for that reason, we're gonna be losing 20% of the trends. And the code recognizes this issue and the code says, just use here a factor of 0.8 for the small eccentricity that may come with the axial load. So now understand this 0.8 is gonna be for the small eccentricity effect. So I'm gonna say this 0.8 for small eccentricity. Meaning, moment with the axial load. So we don't really calculate out this moment. We're not going to do analysis to figure out this amount of moment. But we say if I just give you here any axial load, just conserve some moment for it. And to conserve the moment, I'm not asking you to do the moment analysis, right? Right? I'm just asking here to use a factor of 0.8 just reduce the axial load strength a little bit. Okay, good. So is this related to the pi, this AST? I'm gonna say no, this gonna be the vertical steel cross-section area. And the steel ratio, vertical steel ratio goes between 1% and 8%. So you have minimum 1% steel ratio and maximum 8%. So what does it mean by this equation here? It means your AS minimum, you can call it AST if you want to, since it is written like this in the code equation, it's gonna be equal to, and this gonna be minimum, 1% times AG. What is AG? Cross section area of the column. Like you just take the column, let's say 12 by 12, we say 144 square inches, but lie by 1%, it's gonna be one point, it's gonna be 14.4 square inches. 1% is gonna be 1.44 square inches. Is it okay? How about the max? I'm going to say the max is going to be 8%. Just take 8% of the cross-section area of the column. So this is going to be one of the checks that you need to do for a given column. Or when you throw some rebars inside the column, be sure that you're not going below 1% and not above 8%. So it okay, good. It's going to be that simple. The maximum spacing here between two vertical rebars, let's say, let's look here. When you have four rebars in the column, one at each corner. You cannot leave a corner without a bar. Look what happened here. I may have six bars. So in this case, I'm gonna put a couple of bars here, additional to what I have here. This distance here is gonna be maximum of six inches. So the question is, once it goes up of six inches, what would you do? If the column just big, 
right? If this length of the column or this um, the side of the column is really longer and you cannot really live with this six inches, what would you do? You can say you put this cross tie. So do you call this? This is called here cross tie. In the past, it used to be like this in the code. Nowadays, you just made it as one word. So you have this cross line. And you have different here configuration. Look at this. When you have a three bars on the column, this could be the standard or the typical configuration that you go with. It's gonna be one at each corner, and then you start with one in the middle. Once you go above six inches, you start to put this cross lines. Or you can do something like this if you like to go here with 10 reverse. So different configuration, just to show you what a designer is going to do once it comes to rebar layout inside the column section. Look at the vertical spacing between ties because that was what? That was spacing between the vertical rebars. Now we're talking about vertical spacing between ties. And look at this, this taken here from an actual project. Look at the spacing here, about four and a half inch, right? About roughly. The vertical spacing of the ties is gonna be critical because if the distance between two ties is gonna be really large, the vertical rebar is gonna be buckling between them. And you don't want this to happen because once the rebar is gonna start to buckle, you're gonna be losing the strength. The code here says, if you like to design the ties, you need to be careful about the spacing. And the spacing is going to be the maximum of the spacing, right? Should I say the maximum or the minimum? I'm going to say it's going to be the minimum of the following three conditions. Item number one is going to be 48 times the tie bar diameter, meaning, let's say if I, this tie is number four, like this, it means the diameter is gonna be half an inch, right? And in this case, for A, item A, is gonna be 48 times 0.5, we are talking about 24 inch for the spacing. So for the first item here, I'm gonna say, code says, maximum is gonna be 24 inch spacing. Why? Because I use number four for the tie itself. You can say, how about the vertical rebars? Because the second one, B, it says 16 times the original bar diameter. You say, okay. For this bar, a vertical bar is number eight. What's going to happen? The bar diameter is going to be what? One inch. I'm going to go with 16 times one. It's going to be 16 inch. What do you mean by that? I'm going to say 16 times the bar diameter, 16 times longitudinal or vertical bar diameter. So it's gonna be 16 inch. So after the second condition here, which one controls? 16 or 24? Say so 16 inch. So far it's gonna be 16 inch. And then the third one, it says the least column dimension. Meaning if I have a column like this, Let's say the column size, I'm gonna put here some column size, column size is 12 by 16 inch. Which one is the least? I'm gonna say the least is gonna be 12 inch. So for this one, it's gonna be 12 inches. So I'm gonna say, okay, this is gonna be for the 12 inches and this is gonna be controlling my design. Now compare the three values, 24, 16, 12. You can go here with 12 inch for the spacing. I said, okay, all of this is all good news, right? But look, once you go here to California, you have six inch max. Why? Because of seismic issues. It's true that this column is not to resist seismic forces, but since the building moves and you're gonna have lateral movement, it means that you're gonna have additional moment. So you'd like to keep here the spacing to six inches. So in California, you're gonna be adding a fourth item. It's gonna be six inch max. So in a case like this, usually six inches is gonna be controlling your design. This is gonna be for the spacing. This is what the code says about the spacing for the ties. Any questions? 
Yeah, Professor, for uh, yes. letter C was, um, sorry, one sec. So was that for like the whole size of the column or just the rebars? Um, like, which one? Like, like about this one? The concrete? Yeah. The least column dimension? No, this gave you the column here. It's gave you 12, let's say, by 16. I just give you here an example. Okay. So it says the least but column then, means take the smaller of the two. Okay, but then no matter what, it's still going to be less than six inches. Yes, in California. Okay. Size Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Professor, I have a question. Yes. For all of our problems, are we going to, going to assume we're in California and we're designing for California? Yes, absolutely. Yes. We're in California. We're not going anywhere. We're staying here. Okay, thank you, Professor. No problem. All right, we have here one example. I have the column size 16 by 16. For, I have here eight rebars. So it says here eight number nine rebars. So each one of this is gonna be number nine. And you know the, what the good thing about number nine? A sub B, which means cross section area for one rebar only, is give you one square inches. So here AST, I can conclude that AST equals this give you eight times one, is give you eight square inches. AST. How about the cross section area for the concrete? I'm gonna say oh, this is gonna be simple. AG equals 16 by 16. Okay, it gives me here a cover and a tie size and the spacing. I'm gonna say, maybe the spacing is gonna be one thing that I need to check, right? But for the tie size, it's not really critical to me yet at this point. So I don't know how to come up with the design when it comes to the tie size. And the spacing that you are talking about is gonna be, of course, center to center of the tie. We don't talk here about the clear. It's gonna be center to center. It says here in this example, find the maximum design axle load strength. For the type column of cross section shown in the figure below. Check the type. Assume a short column. I don't know what this mean by assume short column, but it seems that when the column becomes very tall, what's gonna happen? They're gonna have an issue with buckling that I don't wanna go there. So I'm gonna say short column means don't worry about buckling. The concrete strength of prime C is gonna be 4,000 PSI and the steel is gonna be the standard 60. Okay. First, I have here AST as we say is gonna be eight square inches. And the column size A sub G is gonna be 16 by 16. I'd like to check here the steel ratio. So what is this symbol for? You can say this is gonna be for the steel ratio. Rho usually refers to the steel ratio. You can say rho is gonna be equals to AST, cross section area of the vertical rebars, divided by the cross section area of the column itself, A sub G 16 by 16. If you remember, it's got the column 16 by 16. This ratio is 0.03. My range is from one to 8%. Where do I get this from? I'm gonna say, let me go back. Here it is. It says here 1% to 8%. So as long as the steer ratio is gonna be within one to 8%, I'm good. The steer ratio I'm getting here is actually 3%. So I should be fine. So here's the first check. You check the steer ratio for any given column. If it is less than 1%, you need to add more rebars. If it's gonna be more 8%, you cannot really do it this way. So you need to reduce it. How about the strength of the column? I'm gonna say strength of the column, I have my equation here. Here is the concrete component strength. Here is the vertical rebar component strength. And you have the fee factor, and then you have this 0.8 factor. This 0.8 factor to account for the small interest, which means for some moment that we are not going to be accounting for. So it's going to be 0.8 
This 0.65 is the fee factor. Okay. And then you have the concrete component, 0.85 times F prime C, the 4 KSI. A sub G is going to be the 16 by 16, 256. AST, cross section area of eight. You can see here plus the steel component, 60 times eight. What's 60? It's going to be 6 KSI times eight square inches. I have total of 688 caps. This is going to be the maximum column axle load that it can support. Questions? Much simpler than beams, right? All right. I'd like to check the time. Yes, sir. Yes, right. I know you just said it, but uh, the CPN max is the max capacity of the column. Is that correct? Yeah, this gives me the maximum axle compression, like the, the compression strength. You can call it strength, axle strength and compression. You can call it maximum. Okay. Yeah, this gives you like the column capacity, axle load capacity. Sometimes we call it this way. Okay, thank you. No problem. How do you check the ties here? The ties says here number three at 16. So we're going to say 48 times 3 eight of an inch, which is a bar diameter for the tie. This is going to be 18 inches. 16 times longitudinal bar diameter. The longitudinal bar diameter for number nine is going to be 1.128. So this is what? This is going to be DB, which means a bar diameter for number nine rebors. This is going to be 18 inches. Least column dimension. Now this column square, 16 by 16. So I'm going to say it's going to be 16 inch. So in this case, number three at 16 is going to be okay. Provided that, that this business, because I have taken this from your book, right? From the book that we use, it is not intended to be in California. But once we do it in California, this is not good. So I'm going to say not good in California. Let me add this note here. Not good in California. But it's going to be okay anywhere else. As long as the seismic code doesn't apply and you don't have a problem there. Is it okay? Let me go back here to the picture that shows the column section. Now, do I need here to provide the cross tie? What's the cross tie? I'm going to say here's a cross tie, something like this. Do I need to provide this? You can say, based on the previous slide that I'm going to go back to it, if the spacing, clear spacing here, is going to be within six inches, you don't really need one. So once you go up up six inches, you need one. I said, okay, let me check this out. Total 16. I'm going to have here one and a half inch cover. Then I'm going to have the tie size. Then I have the clear spacing between the rebars. So I'd like here to check the clear spacing between two vertical rebars. They're gonna be taking your 16 inch, you subtract one and a half inch from here, one and a half inch from there, right? So it's gonna be 16 subtracting three, it's gonna be now 13 inches. You subtract two pi bar diameter. So it's gonna be three eighth of an inch times two is gonna be three quarter of an inch. And then you subtract the vertical bar size three times. And then you divide at the end, divide by two to get the, the clear spacing between the two vertical rebars. So it is listed here. It's going to be 16, total column size, subtracting two times one and a half inch for the cover, subtracting two times two, three eighths of an inch. So I'm going to say this is going to be for the tie size, tie diameter times two. This gives you the cover. This gives you the vertical rebars because I have three rebars. And then at the end, I divide by two. Why? Because I have two spaces. It turned to be 4.4, less than six inches. So I'm good. 
I don't really need to do anything to this column. This column is good in terms of the rebar configuration. So, okay, good. Another example. You have 24 inch by 24 inch column. Now, you see here the difference in the way it is detailed. This from an actual detail, from an actual drones from our office. As you see here, the column is 24 by 24. This gave a very standard that you provide three quarter inch chamfer because you'd like to protect the edge of the concrete. If you do it like, like, like this, the edge is gonna get broken. So it's gonna be very standard and you can look it up in any column, any wall, while you walk on campus or you just look at any building. See here at the edge, you have this chamfer. When it comes to calculations for A sub G, you don't deduct anything for this. This is gonna be, this is like for construction, but you don't, you don't care about this as if it's not there. As you see here, the typical, this is gonna be one and a half inch clear. And it says here, F prime says gonna be 5,000. And it says here, determine the maximum column axial load capacities for this column based on the code range of vertical reinforcement ratio. So, okay, how many rebars? Do I really have only eight rebars? Because it says here, based on the code range of vertical reinforcement ratio. What is the code vertical reinforcement ratio? What is that range? We're gonna say 1%. To how much? Can someone help me? 8%. 8%, correct, thank you. Meaning, I'd like to check here for 1%. If I put 1%, how much the capacity is gonna be? I'm gonna be doing 8% and see how much is the capacity. It says here, consider the code, minimum and maximum C ratio. What's the minimum? It's gonna be 1%, maximum is gonna be 8%. I'll tell you the reason why do we do this in actual project. In actual project, the architect is gonna say, I don't want the column to go beyond 24 by 24. If you can keep it like this, it's gonna be great. Now, who comes up with this strength? Is it me as a structural engineer or the architect, in your opinion? Who's gonna come up with this value? Jacob, can you help me with this? I would think you would. I will, right? Because the architect doesn't care about the properties of the concrete. So I'm gonna estimate this 5,000. Then what's next? I'm gonna be using the column size he gave me. And now I need to know what is the range of strength that this column is gonna be able to support, like how many kips? And then I'm gonna be figuring out the demand. What does it mean by demand? The demand means the design load on the column. How much the column is going to be supporting? It's going to be paid on tributary area. It's going to be paid on the amount of dead load on life load, number of stories. It's going to be, it's going to be something here that you need to care of. And now after I do the demand, I'm going to compare it with the two limits, right? With the capacity for 1%, capacity for 8%. If my demand falls between 1% to 8%, I'm going to say, yeah, this column is good. So I can live with 24 by 24. And all of that, I'm going to do it very quick. So this gave you like in the schematic phase of design, means preliminary design, without going into lots of details. I just want to confirm to the architect that this column size is going to be okay. Otherwise, he can say, well, do you really want it to be 24 by, let's say, 48 inch or 30 inch by 30 inch? I need to give an answer before I start my design and before also he can finalize his design. So to have a quick answer, I need to see what type of capacity we're talking about for this column size. This is the reason that I'm gonna be testing it for 1% and 8%. Does this make sense? All right. Here is the gross section area of the column. 24 by 24, it's gonna be 576 square inches. Consider here two cases, 1% and this is gonna be case one and here's case two. 8%, okay. 1% meaning 5.76 square inches. So great. How many rebars would I put? I'm gonna say, you know what? In a column like this, I'm gonna have a minimum of eight rebars. 
How do I know it? From experience. I mean, 24 by 24, it is not because of the picture. I'm gonna have minimum of eight rebars. If you put a rebar here at each corner and put some rebars here, put some cross ties, it's gonna make it work. So, okay. If I put here eight number eight, what's gonna be the actual cross section area for this vertical rebars? I'm gonna say it's gonna be 6.32. Take 0.79. What is the 0.79? Number eight. A sub B for number eight is 0.79 square inches. Okay, good. Line eight by 0.79 is gonna be 6.32. Is it great? In reality, now this gonna be the used AST, right? The 6.32 and not the 5.76. 5.76 is just the limit, but in reality, this is what I have used 6.32 square inches. Now let's check here the C ratio that I have picked. Finally, it's gonna be 1.1%, more than 1%. This is good. I satisfy the first code limit. Now let's look here at the strength. I'm gonna say I have the 0.65, the fee factor, the 0.8 reduction for a small eccentricity. Let me write them down. This is gonna be a reduction. Now 0.85 is your constant times five because I have five case sign. So this gave you here F prime C. What's the 576? You can see gross section area, 6.32, the steel area. So this gave you the concrete component strength. This gave you here the steel strength, 60 times 6.32. This gave you 1456 caps. So I'm gonna say this column at least is gonna be able to support 1456 caps. So great. How about maximum? What is like the worst case if I'd like to put lots of rebars, right? What, how much strength are we talking about? I say, okay, let me try here the 8%. 8% means 46 square inches. This is gonna be lots of rebars. I can live with 28 number 11. Someone's gonna say, why 28? This number, you need to be able to divide by four, you're gonna have a good number. Why? Because you have here four corners. If you put here two axes, you need to have symmetry about X and Y axis. Let's say 28 number 11, is gonna get here 43 square inches less than the 46, means my choice has given you K. As a steel ratio is gonna be 7.6, it's still a lot, lots of rebounds. Actually, to build this is gonna be a hell is a, of a job. I mean, you cannot really build it this way, but it's just theoretical value. You apply the same equation again and look at this. You have 25, 39 kips of a strength. So the range for this column, in terms of strength, is gonna be between 1456 all the way to 2539. If I'm gonna do here a design, I'm gonna say, you know what? Our maximum is gonna be maybe about 2000. If the load is gonna be above 2000 kips, change the column size. I'm not gonna push it to this number. I'm just thinking here in reality, in actual design, we don't really push it to here. I'm not gonna be loading the column, let's say to 2500 kips. No, maybe 2000 is gonna be my max. All right, I'm done for today. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, hang around, otherwise I'll see you next time. Professor, uh, one quick question. Um, so you mentioned that most uh, rectangular columns have that chamfered edge. Uh, yeah. What's the reasoning for that? Just to protect it from getting hit by anything, any moving objects during construction, mm. or even after construction, you can break it easily. Mm, okay. Because it's gonna be very thin, it's gonna be sharp, you can just break it. If you mm. just hit it with anything, you're gonna break it. Okay, so that's the reasoning yeah. for it. Okay, thank you. Okay.